I have a code file with about 17,000 lines of code. Uh, it was machine generated, to be fair, uh, but it generates super optimal code for what we want. So we were able to get no pin cost, the exact assembly that we wanted to run with pretty good and readable code, and the uh, fast before algorithm that does the compression. And now going to all, go all the way back to talking about uh, Lucene and the course that we encode there with batching and merging. So try to imagine that they have a, a list of sorted items. Okay. And I need to merge that with some update to this. Remove those items, uh, uh, up, uh, uh, remove those items and those items and all of that needs to be sorted. So this sounds like a classic uh, uh, CS101 problem. Okay, given a sorted array, here a list of removals, a list of additions, to the array has to be sold in the end. Mm-hmm. Okay, costs for that tend to be log n times n, the number of modifications that you have, which can be pretty expensive. So especially if you're talking about an array and then you have to move things, etc. So that is a huge aspect from uh, our perspective, because that's the point. I need to be able to do those sort of merges when you add or remove items as efficiently as possible. So what we started doing then is we realized that because the CP4 uh, algorithm was faster than memcopy, we're actually able to do the following trick. We have a sorted buffer of items and modification on that buffer. And it would it was cheaper to unpack the buffer and just scan through both arrays at once, the unpacked buffer, additions and removals, and generate the encoded version again. So from a, a, a pure operational perspective, that sounds like this is really expensive. But because we're able to do that, at, uh, because we operate on the compressed form, and the cost of actually uh, uh, bringing the data to the CPU was the dominating cost, we're able to achieve really good performance. Now, just to give some context here, in a 4 kilobyte uh, a buffer, I can plug in something in the order of 7,000 document IDs. So that is a really high compression ratio, and that gives me a lot of flexibility. And so if we put all of those together, we were able to actually achieve the ability to independently update the index, and then we get the, uh, and then we're able to actually uh, make small changes or big changes without this, oh, I have to, I'm going to do this fast, and I will, but I would have to pay for that in the future. Mm. So all of this, this is just about how do I actually index. So I have, take all of the data, throw it into the, the structure that I want. The next stage, which was a lot more complicated, is actually build the query engine. And this is complicated because I'm giving you a lot of freedom. So... Presumably, in the past, you run into scenarios where you have to write a compound index. What is a compound index? Uh, I'm writing a, I'm writing a field, I'm writing a query, and I need to touch two fields. Right. Okay. If I always need to touch to query on those two fields, let's say first name and last name, I want them to be both in the same index. Makes so sense. I typically would, yeah, so I typically have last name and then first name. And then I can search either by last name or first name or just by last name. But this index on those two fields will not let me search just by first name. Because it's second in the list. Exactly. And you know that because you have used a physical phone book in the past, right. which is what <laughs> we're talking about, basically. Right. Okay. Yeah. By the way, uh, 
I had gotten to the point where I'm hiring people who never used the phone book in the past. <laughs> when, they, when, when, I, when I told them, t- talk to them about phone books, they think about the app in the phone. <laughs> and like, yeah. Um, I'm incredibly um, horrified by that discovery. <laughs> For those yeah. listening at home, a phone book was a large thing about this thick <laughs> that would be delivered every year on your front doorstep and it would contain the, the names and phone numbers of everybody in your city. Yeah. Every, every person Salted, and every yeah. company. Yeah. And to be, uh, uh, and it, would, it sounds also a lot weirder because today you realize that not only were we handing names and phone numbers to everyone around, which is, oh, wait, this is data breach. People <laughs> actually paid to have their name on the phone book. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so anyway, so the problem with indexes like that is that you have to predefine the structure very early on and you cannot uh, 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 use that dynamically. Right. One of the things that we, we really wanted to do is to allow you to just tell me the fields that you want to query on. And now this is my responsibility to be able to uh, figure out how to execute efficiently. And if you think about the study I showed where we have posting list of items, so this is basically how it works behind the scenes. You are making your queries. Give me all of the uh, blog posts where the title include this term and the status is publish and this is in the future. And those are effect- internally, those are three different terms that are not tied together into a, a physical structure. So you may want to say, give me all of the published items in the past year or give me whatever, whatever combination you want. In a traditional database with traditional indexing system, if you want to support all of those queries, you have a combinatorial explosion of the number of indexes you want in order to actually execute those queries efficiently. The way that we are doing that, we are uh, taking all of those individual posting lists. And remember, they are so compressed and highly efficient. And then I can just do intersection, exclusion, and all those sort of things really, really efficiently and cheaply based on the compressed data forms and the way that it works. Uh, it turns out this is also, to a large extent, how Lucene works. So we were able to stand on the shoulders of giant in this regard. Mm-hmm. But this was an amazing, and we were able to, because of those things, we were able to get far better performance until we run a bad query. Uh-huh. And uh, the bad query was something like this. Give me all of the published blog posts, sort by date, okay. top five. That's a bad query. It sounds, it sounds simple. In it SQL, sounds it like simple. A, yeah, it's very simple. Now, think about what it means from the agent perspective. Okay, give me all of the published queries. Okay, I have 70 million of them. Yeah, so if I did that without filtering, that would be a problem. Uh, yeah. So now you want me to sort them by uh, date descending. Mm. So we typically, uh, uh, so typically you, you start scanning through the list. And this is typically, uh, if you didn't say anything, then this is based on insertion order. So you effectively have to scan through 70 million records. Mm. And then you have to sort them. I see. And that turns out to be super expensive. So the right. moment that you, so the moment that you have a, a a query that has to sort over a large amount of data, you're paying a huge amount of cost. For Lucene, they are paying that cost. If you have a large data set you need to sort, they would have to sort the entire thing. Now there are tricks on how to do that using heap and not much of other stuff, but you still have to pay the cost. Uh, where Lucene does something really interesting is that it, when you want to sort, uh, when you want to sort on a field, it would read into memory all of the value, all of the unique values in that field. 
So if you have, uh, I want to sort by date, a date a creation date, for example, which tend to be relatively unique, you may have 10 million items with 10, 10 million distinct uh, dates. So you're going to have an array with 10 million items on it. Hmm. And then it is able to sort very quickly because it can just jump to the relevant location in the array and sort on that. I see. And due to the nature of the way that Lucene works, then it is able to cache that for a period of time, so that's good. But Corax doesn't work like that. Corax doesn't have, oh, I, ha- I can optimize based on things that aren't going to change. So this was a huge problem for us because now I have 70 million records and I have to find the date for each one of those before I can even do the actual uh, uh, sorting. Now, a 70 million records and the data set that we're testing was a few hundred gigabytes in size. So you, ha- you now have to start reading randomly from the disk. And it's, it's key the system. So we couldn't do that. Uh, for small data sets, it was amazing because it was able to do it very, very efficiently. But for large ones, it's a killer. So we actually implemented an optimization where the the way that we actually structure the query isn't based on uh, the way that you wrote it. Hmm. We rewrite internally what we are doing in order to execute that. Okay. In this case, we have a large data set. The, the, the number of uh, uh, results in this query is relatively large. So we already have an index that we can scan through the uh, 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 to the records in an older fashion. So if I have a lot of results, I'm going to do a speculative uh, 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 operation and say, okay, let me start scanning the list of dates from the bottom up and try to find matches with the results of this query. Because I'm, because I'm searching bottom up, this is descending order then I'm actually getting that in the uh, right order back. Hmm. So the, the entire thing, and again, I'm trying to describe in an hour a process that took us multiple years to actually implement design. And uh, I don't know if it makes sense uh, to hear that. At the, uh, you at least have the reference of... Uh, uh, the hop encoder and the same pass before, etc. To to go look if the listener are interested in that. But the upside of that is that we were able to achieve that goal of being ten times faster, being that much easier. And, and it's funny because the cost isn't limited to oh, I'm just my queries are faster. Reduced allocations mean less. Time in GC means that I have more time to do actual work. Overall latency is up. <laughs> Overall performance is, is higher just because of that. And it's just really funny to see that the, uh, the effect across the board, across everything after this. Yeah, you, you, it sounds like you had to solve a lot of hard technical problems in order to implement coax. Yeah. yeah and that's... Uh, yeah. Part of the reason that you started ten years ago. Now, this this indexing <laughs> engine is in the product now. It's in RavenDB. Yes. How long? Yes. How long did it ago did you uh, go to production with that? Uh, about three months or so. Oh, brand so new. We, we, yeah, yeah. We released it in early October. Okay. Uh, what's been the feedback yeah. from your customers? It's faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't. It, it's funny because. That's the only feedback that I care about. So there are a few features that we didn't get to implement. Uh, again, Lucene is amazing, and we had to do a lot. Um, so there's some, some, oh, I, I want to use that, but I need you to support this feature or something like that. Uh, the usual bunch of bugs, oh, I'm seeing something weird here. Uh, but in general, the, the overall experience has been really, really positive. It's faster, and I don't need to change anything. You know, uh, you have a configuration field, mm-hmm. uh, set it to Corax, or as I like to call it, make it faster, and you're done. Uh, so the code for the, the client code for creating an index and using oh, the index, they are the same. 
what is exactly. it using Lucene versus coax. Yeah. I like that a there lot. Is, yeah, there is zero change. Uh, I will actually tell you something about it. Uh, in 2015, we hit the limits of our architecture in RevenDB. Hmm. Uh, Corax, uh, the beginning of Corax then was part of that, but whereas we couldn't invest in Corax because we have so much problem as well. And one of the things that happened was that we made the decision in order to actually fix those sort of issues, we have to effectively uh, uh, break backward compatibility and start from effectively scratch. And that was the right technical decision. And it has been really, really, really annoying. Annoying? It's annoying, yeah. I mean, people don't want to upgrade. Oh, I have to change stuff. I'm right. not doing that. I still have users who are using the old version, and we support the old version just because of that. So the hard line for us was no user-visible things except, you know, tell us to use it, and that's it. Yeah, that's typical. As you... Uh... Uh, well, first of all, from a customer's point of view, there's a challenge if they need to change their client code and they have, you know, thousands of applications using your product and they're distributed yeah. all over the world. That's a huge cost to, to, to make that upgrade. Uh-huh. Um, it's... But from a from a vendor point of view, we as, as Microsoft deals with this all the time, you can't continue supporting everything forever, if it's, especially if there's just like two or three people I have... that you're supporting these. I have, yeah, I have used those features. Who's... I have users who are still talking to me about uh, I needed to run Windows XP. Man. I have, at one point in 2012-13, we had the management interface for the database was written in Silverlight. I oh, still yeah. have used, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, to the audience uh, at home, like phone books, Silverlight <laughs> is something that we used to use. Yeah, it didn't last as long as phone books, but yeah. it also, it, it's now extinct, just like dinosaurs yeah. and phone books. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the problem is that I have users who I still need to support using Silverlight. I cannot longer even, I have to, I have to use a dedicated VM running old version of Windows. Uh, I see. And, oh, so and like Windows to run on Windows now? Is that true? No. No, there is no way for so you. That's what Microsoft's philosophy is. We'll, we'll support you for a while, but there's a cutoff at some yeah. point. Yeah. We're just going to stop supporting you. And my uh, my thinking is that, you know, 10 years sounds like a really good number. Mm. Uh, but, you know, uh, one of the things that was really interesting to, to learn from building an infrastructure tool is the number of crucial systems that are just there and running yeah, and no one know, no one even knows about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is a really famous uh, uh, a guy in uh, computer science literature, Leslie Lamport, and he wrote a lot of the basic algorithms about distributed systems. And he has a quote that I really love, and it says something like that: "A distributed system is a system." where the failure of, comp- of a server that you never knew existed broke your system. <laughs> yeah. And it's very much like that. And yeah, I, I, at one point, I was at a tour in a new school for my daughter, and I got an emergency phone call from a customer. Uh, our system broke down, and uh, we need to fix it. And as I'm trying to understand what's going on, it turned out that they had a optimistic quality violation in the system and the true and error, and no one ever caught that. And they were running for three years, and no two people ever needed to modify the same document. Uh-huh. And now they apparently did, and now the system is broken. <laughs> I know that is the. You explicitly asked for it to be this way, now you, but you never handled that. <laughs> And the thing that killed me, I was talking for the system guys. You know, the guy who makes sure that the servers are running and replaces the hard disk and uh, give you the uh, domain user. He knew that the system was there and he could tell me what the process name was, more or less, but he had no idea what was going on. 
Yeah. But I, as the database vendor, had to basically go back and figure out what was going on. And the the the, the people who wrote it were long gone. No one knew how it worked, but no, that's the system. Uh, yep, during my consulting days, I remember lots of cases like that. Sometimes the source code doesn't even exist anymore. You've got to <laughs> somehow regenerate uh, that, and sometimes I, I, uh, at one yeah, at one point I had a policy. I had a I had a client who refused to use source control. Right. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't even know how to approach that, but. Uh, uh, I made sure that uh, part of the deployment of the code, including the uh, all of the sources, so you had an embedded resource in the in the binary. Here so is the all of the files. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've never encountered anybody that didn't want to use source control, but I did. Um, it was ten years ago. I was a consultant. I often encountered people that weren't using it. They were just ignorant about it. They didn't. They weren't yeah. aware of the importance of it or the existence of it. Um, yeah, and but generally when they learned about it, they were open to the idea. Yeah, except that now we have a uh, Git and talk about food guns. Like you have to be, you have to learn to use that properly. Right. And uh, honestly, I'm I think I'm thinking about. I've been doing this for twenty five years now, and. I'm looking at uh, uh, new people coming into the, the profession and just the changes in C sharp alone from a, a link, async, a, a vector instructions, uh, pattern matching, all those sort of things. Uh, and in the environment of, oh, you have a Git and merge conflict and stuff like that, the amount of things that you have to deal with is absolutely insane. Sure. Yeah. Um, we're just about at time. Uh, is there, can you point us to some resources? People want to learn more about this. Uh, so I actually had, uh, I had an in-depth uh, webinar talking about Coax recently. I will send you the link to that. Oh, great. I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. And you can go to revenue.net. We have Revin running there and you can test it and try it out. Um, you can run it on anything from Raspberry Pi or up, uh, including uh, in the cloud. Excellent. Well, yeah. Oren, I really appreciate your time and all the knowledge you're pouring out. This is, this is a concept that are really, I'm really unfamiliar with, so I learned a great deal today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, my problem is that uh, I got into technology, so I wouldn't have to talk to people. And uh, yeah, uh, and it's funny because uh, writing and coding and developing turns out to be an incredible social uh, experience. I. Uh, I, I count my, the start of my career to working on open source projects and getting in touch with really high quality people on open source mailing list. And, you know, proving my credentials, getting friends from that sort of things that I've been friends with them for decades at this point. Uh, it's really funny that from I don't want to talk to people to I love talking to you. I love talking to people. <laughs>